Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 301 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. This is an episode that we recorded a few months ago to thank our patrons at patreon.com slash StarQuest for their generosity in making this and all our shows at StarQuest possible. We gave them early, exclusive access, but now we're sharing it with you to show you one of the benefits of being a patron. So, Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, we're going to be talking about things like what mysterious experiences have you and I had, Dom, a kind of a follow-up to last week's episode where we talked about the listeners' experiences. We're also going to be talking about Bob Lazar, the Bronze Age Collapse, the Holy House of Loretto, uh, church buildings being spared from natural disasters, my favorite science fiction authors, why God created dinosaurs, the morality of what the Donner Party did, uh, what the Foo Fighters of World War II may have been, how to interpret uh, a listener's dream, the spiritual implications of using psychedelic drugs, will we wear clothing on the new earth, have we found interstellar material in the Pacific Ocean, a extreme human performance like walking on hot coals and lying on beds of nails, could we be extensions of Adam and Eve's consciousness? The icon of the Black Madonna? Will we as individuals encounter miracles in our lifetimes? And what to make of charismatic phenomena? All excellent questions. And so, folks, please enjoy the show. So, Jimmy, let's get right into our questions. Our first question comes from Jason Wapinik, and he asks... Jimmy and Dom, the listeners shared with you their mysterious experiences uh, back in episode 100 or 200. Have y'all ever had your own and can you share and Jimmy analyze them for us? Well, um, so part of that question is for you, Dom. Have you had any mysterious experiences? I've had two that came to mind as I thought about this. And the first one was when I was in college. I was uh, living in an apartment with a roommate, uh, my roommate, Kevin, and I uh, it was it was a I think probably a Saturday. I was sleeping in, laying in bed. I was half awake, and I had this image of myself, very clear as day, of seeing myself from above and standing next to the bed, next to my head, at the bed level. Was this short creature about the size, about you know, as tall as it would be to be at you know uh, next to my head as it stood there, mm -hmm. and it had what I could only describe as a piggish, doggish face. And it was staring intently at the side of my head as I slept. It was really strange. And later that day, I was talking to my roommate, Kevin, and I brought it up. And as I was about to describe it, he said, did it have a piggish, doggish face? Which is a really specific thing to ask. And it turns out he had the same experience the same day hmm. uh, that morning. Uh, so don't know what it means, but it's a very strange Thing to happen to both of us at the same time and so very specifically in its details so that's one experience i had the other was a uh, strange sort of second hit experience uh when i was a uh, young kid my parents had these friends who uh, lived in a, a farmhouse in maine a very old farmhouse in the family for you know a hundred years or something like that and we would go stay with them on family vacations and one time they showed us this polaroid picture the old if if folks are old enough to remember Polaroid photos were these instant cameras. You pull the trigger and it rolled out a developed little square picture that developed slowly as you, as a, uh, you know, over the course of a minute or so. Um, and so you had a nearly instant photo sort of like we have today with, with uh, cell phones and they were showing us this photo. Uh, one of the person said, I just got it and I wanted to take a picture with it. So I stood in the doorway between the, the kitchen and the living room facing the living room, took the photo, and when it developed, it was of the kitchen. And so it was a very strange thing. But that's a second hand, so I wasn't there to see it, but they were sharing with us. They're reliable people. They weren't, you know, prone to weird pranks or something like that. So um, I just chalked it up to old farmhouse spookiness. Um, so that, those are 
the two that came to mind when I when I thought about it. Okay, so in terms of the first one, um, you and your roommate having a common dream is is a known phenomenon that's known as a shared dream, and it 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 would be explainable, especially now it could be random chance, but. Um, if it involves something as specific as a creature staring at you and your roommate with a pig dog face, that unless you'd both been watching a pig dog movie recently or something, nope. then presumably <laughs> there's not a natural explanation for it, in which case it would likely be telepathy, would, mm. uh, either between you and your roommate or between if there was an objective pig dog entity between you and the pig dog entity and your roommate and the pig dog entity in terms of what it might be. Well, you know, who can say um, it may not have been anything than something other than what rumbled up from one of y'all's imaginations. Um, on the other hand, you know, I, I know people are going to wonder, could it be a demon? And the answer is yes, it could have been, but if it didn't do anything, um, then you can just be thankful to God that even if it was a demon and it might not have been, it mm -hmm. didn't really seem to do anything. I prefer telepathy. <laughs> yeah. That, that would be cool ability to have well, demons roommate, rolling around. <laughs> roommate to roommate telepathy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, in terms of the other experience, so we always want to think of natural explanations first. Now, of course, one could think of some paranormal thing involving you know, warped space time or um, or psychokinesis that bent the light coming from one room. So it ended up on the photo, even though the neighbor was turned the other way. But we always want to look at um, at natural explanations first. And it seems to me a simple natural explanation is bad memory, that the person was actually facing the kitchen when they took the photo and they misremembered it possibly confusing it with another picture they took when they were facing the uh, the living room. It also occurs to me it could be also uh, if being a new camera to them. They might have triggered it and then turned and mm -hmm. then and then thought they were triggering it. And, the, you know, yeah. that, that sort of thing. So yeah. that that's also possible, too, I think. So, yeah. yeah, I think that would be likely for that. How mm -hmm. about you, Jimmy? What about, what about you? Well, I've had a number of mysterious experiences, and I've talked about most of them before. Um, one that I know I've mentioned before is I, I've had precognitive dreams, in, in, and we'll, I'll do a future episode on precognitive dreams. But one that, um, that I know I've talked about is one that occurred when I was in, I think, junior high school. Um, I dreamed that I was in my art class, and I was painting on a level surface instead of like at an angle on an easel and i was painting with the colors purple and green and then this guy who didn't like me named linden came up and said what do you think you're doing well i had this dream and then the next morning i related it to a friend of mine named charlie who was also in the art class and that day when we went to art class our teacher pulled us off of all of our existing projects so she, she's going to put us on a completely new project. And the reason she was doing this was because there, the school was going to have a carnival coming up, you know, like a little fair. And she had agreed to have our art class paint photo flats for it. You know, those kind of things where you put your head through and get your picture taken. And she had these refrigerator boxes that um, she wanted us to use for these. So they're too big to put on an easel. You had to put them flat on a table. And so that's why I'm painting on a flat surface instead of at an angle. And she assigned me to paint the Incredible Hulk. So I'm painting his purple pants and green skin. And Lyndon comes up and says, what do you think you're doing? And Charlie was standing there and saw this happen and his mouth fell open. You know, because I told him about it ahead of time. And this was it wasn't a significant incident, but it which, in fact, a lot of precognitive dreams are not about significant incidents. They're just about random daily trivia. But this was an event I couldn't have predicted. And it nevertheless, I saw what was essentially a videotape of what was going to happen the next day. I've also commented that a, a surprising amount of the time, 
um, I seem to, I find myself thinking or studying about an obscure issue that is not in the news and not under discussion among people I know. And then within 48 hours, I'm asked about that issue professionally. It's like I'm subconsciously precognizing what I'm going to be asked about within 48 hours. And it often happens in a religious context. So it may be God giving me a precognitive nudge of what I'm going to be called on to do professionally soon to help people better. Although I should note, it doesn't always happen in a religious context, so it's not always that. Um, I've also had some other experiences when Renee died, uh, my wife, my late wife, um, she had been alienated from her father for um, for like 20 years. Um, you know, she came from a broken home and her mom had not allowed her to be around her dad. And, um, she thought that, that the fact her dad had not been in contact with her meant he wasn't interested in her. And she had a lot of resentment over that issue and did not even want him invited to the wedding when we got married. But as it became clear that she was, uh, having a severe health issue and was likely to die, um, you know, uh, she said, do you think we should tell him? And I said, I think he, sh I think he would want to know. So we contacted, we somehow found his phone number. I don't remember how we did that. I know we did not ask Renee's mother because that would have been a huge hullabaloo. And I don't even know that she had his phone number, but we somehow found his phone number and we called it and he wasn't there, but we left a message on his machine, which you had back in the day. And um, within like an hour, he called us back. And the thing was, he wasn't at his home. He lived in another state up north and he wasn't there. He, he was actually in Arkansas at the time and he was on vacation and he had someone looking after his, his house and they saw the message and decided to listen to it and heard what it was about. And then they called him in Arkansas to let him know. And he he then arranged to get on a bus and come up to Fayetteville. And I, um, I told him, you know, I talked to him about if you want to get on Renee's good side, bring her a teddy bear, which he then did. And I left them alone in the hospital room for like 20 minutes and they reconciled after after 20 years of alienation uh his he, he explained that it's not that he wasn't interested in renee it's that he knew renee's mother would never let him around and so um so to avoid ongoing huge family explosions he he kind of backed off but it, he did want contact um and so they reconciled and this is a this is a synchronistic experience. It it involves a meaningful coincidence where um, he was he was he just happened to be on vacation in Arkansas at the time he would need to be there to get to Renee before she died, because she was she after her diagnosis it went very very fast. And so he could have subconsciously precognized where he would need to be in order to reconcile with his daughter before her death. And it there was also could have been coincidences in terms of us being able to find his phone number in time in his friend deciding to listen to this message. There are a number of things where ESP could have been involved at several stages in this chain to enable their last minute reconciliation. Interesting. Okay. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you, uh, Jason, for the question. Our next question comes from Chris, who writes, Hey, Jimmy, I was wondering, have you ever done an episode on Bob Lazar? And what would you say is the most compelling evidence to support his claims? Thanks, Jimmy, and stay awesome. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. Uh, we have covered Bob Lazar. We covered him way back in episode 22 of the show, which you can access by going to mysterious.fm slash 22. Uh, in terms of your second question, what would I say is the most compelling evidence to support his claims? I would say that it's the fact that he had the ability to predict when Area 51 test flights 
were going to be happening. He he told people, uh, you know, I, I work at Area 51 and they do this testing at this particular time. And he took them out into the desert and let them watch the, the air show, basically. And that, since these flights were not publicly announced, that would be evidence supporting his claim to actually work at Area 51. It does not, though, support his claims to have worked on a UFO. Now, I'm very open to uh, the idea that we have UFOs or UAPs, some of which we may have even gotten hold of, that have been reverse engineered. But ultimately, I don't find Bob Lazar's story credible. There are different aspects of it that I think don't um, that are not evidentially well supported, and there that there would be evidence against. Um, but you can listen to episode twenty-two for more information about all that. And our next question comes from Jeremy, who writes, "Jimmy, we have three questions from different family members." I've been wondering about your take on the Bronze Age collapse, 1200 to 1150 BC, the causes, and who the mysterious sea people could have been. From my wife, Kate, your take on Our Lady of Loretto's house moving to Italy, and from nine-year-old Anne, your thoughts on the Catholic Church in Hawaii being spared during the recent wildfires. Thanks for your great podcast. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I haven't studied the Bronze... I'm aware of the Bronze Age collapse. I haven't studied it in detail. Um, that's also true of the Sea Peoples in general. I've done so for people who may not be aware, the Sea Peoples are a group of different people who arrived in the um, Eastern Mediterranean and took over a bunch of territory, or at least tried to. For example, uh, in Upper e in Lower Egypt, down on the Mediterranean coast. Um, the Egyptians would fight battles with the Sea Peoples, and they didn't really name them. They just called them the Sea Peoples because they came from the Mediterranean Sea. We do have some evidence regarding who the Sea Peoples were, and actually they show up in the Bible. If you look early in the history of Israel, um, in, for example, the book of Judges, you'll read about a group of people known as the Philistines. And the Philistines appear to be one of the groups that are known elsewhere as the Sea Peoples. So there are other groups that have been proposed as well. And we may even have a future episode on the Bronze Age collapse and the Sea Peoples. But that's sort of a capsule summary of my present state of knowledge on the subject. When it comes to the Holy House of Loretto, uh, there's this legend that it was moved to Loretto, that it had been a, a house that the Virgin Mary had been in, and it was moved to Loretto by angels. And there is a basis for this story, but it's not literal angels. The evidence is that it, the Holy House was moved to Loretto, Italy, by a family named Angelini. So it was a family named Angel that moved it and it got that got later misunderstood as literal angels moved it uh, when it comes to uh, catholic churches being spared in hawaii or any other situation from natural disasters that can be an act of god's loving care uh, you know for churches and and the people who who use them um, we have to be careful about this in this life we can't know for sure if God went out of his way to perform a miracle to protect the church, it's also possible that he operated in a more subtle way and that this was part of what theologians would call his providence or things he provides for. He provided for these churches to survive, whether he did that by like overtly intervening and changing the course of a, of, of a natural disaster or whether it was in a more general way, he provided for it either way. The next question comes from Tim, who writes, Hey, Jimmy and Dom, I grew up watching and loving science fiction TV shows and movies, but now that I'm a busy husband and father, baby number four is due in March, I've traded in most of my watching for listening to audiobooks and podcasts. You often reference classic science fiction writers and stories, and I really want to read more of those. I'm familiar with a few sci-fi authors, but who are some of your favorites, and are there any specific books you'd recommend? Thanks, and thanks to all of SQPN for being an island of sanity in a chaotic world. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Tim, and congratulations and welcome to baby number four. Uh, in terms of particular authors that I, sci-fi authors that I uh, can recommend, um, I historically have liked uh, several authors, including Jerry Pornell, Larry Niven, Edward Lerner, Tim Powers, and H.P. Lovecraft. Um, Niven is best known for his known space series, uh, which uh, I've read a lot of. Um, in particular, there's a very interesting book called Protector that has an alternative history of humanity and um, and what humanity is meant to become, but doesn't for interesting reasons. And uh, it's a it, it's a little different. It's 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 it interacts with some ideas that are in the Bible, but it's not. It kind of has a secular take on these, but it's still a very interesting story, even if it doesn't really agree with the Bible. Um, one thing I should mention about Niven is um, you will occasionally encounter an individual scene in a book that he'll write that is a little too sexually explicit. Um, it's not hugely explicit, but it's enough that, um, that you should be aware of it. And, but it's typically just one scene out of an entire novel. Um, he, Niven is often written with, uh, Jerry Pornell, who is a really good sci-fi writer in his own right, but together they have done very compelling books, uh, that I've read, including The Moat in God's Eye, its sequel, The Gripping Hand, and also the novel Footfall. I'd, I'd recommend all three of those, especially The Moat in God's Eye and Footfall. The Gripping Hand is also good to read as a sequel. Um, Niv Pornell has also written books on his own, including King David's Spaceship and also a book called Star Swarm, which when I read it, it was like, this is like Harry Potter, only good. One of the things I hated about, I had to end up reading the first Harry Potter novel for apologetic reasons because people, it was a huge issue at the time. And in order to be able to comment on it intelligently, I need to actually read it. Unlike some commenters who would condemn things without having read them. Well, I had to read Harry Potter and frankly, I was not impressed. I thought it was poorly written wish fulfillment where Harry Potter, you know, he's got a he's got a girl sidekick and a boy sidekick, and he's the most important person in the world. And we learn that on page one. And stuff is just handed to Harry Potter on a silver platter. Now, he later faces challenges, but his importance as the most important person in the world is just served up right at the beginning. He doesn't earn it. It's just given to him. And I think that that's connected to J.K. Rowling's uh, family situation because she had gone through a divorce. She was raising her sons. She wanted to kind of create a magical life for her sons out of the family tragedy they'd experienced. And there's a lot of wish fulfillment going on here that is not earned. Well, when I read Star Swarm, it's like, wow, this is like Harry Potter, only good. Um, it's about a, a, a boy um, named Kip, if I recall correctly. He's, he's got a girl sidekick. He's got a boy sidekick. And Kip is the most important person on his planet. Only he doesn't know it. And we don't learn that on page one. It's something that slowly emerges over the course of the story, which is very well told. So it's earned. And Kip is not put in the position of he's this magical boy right from, you know, where everybody, you know, falls over themselves to please him right from the beginning. He's, he's actually growing up on a world whose name is paradise, but it's so rough and rugged as a world. People actually call it purgatory. And um, and he's he's got a kind of tough life growing up in the bush. Um, but it's Star Swarm is really good. Um, also, I mentioned Tim Powers. He's written a bunch of modern fantasy novels. Um, two of my favorites are, are a novel called Last Call and also a novel called Expiration Date. Uh, Last Call is, um, 
is really good. It's part of a trilogy. And the second part of the trilogy, Expiration Date, I think is even better than Last Call. It's about a little boy named Kudhumi Parganas or Kudi, who becomes involved with the ghost of Thomas Alva Edison. And it's it's just outstanding. There's there's tons of fascinating stuff. Uh, Tim Powers is so creative that he he has just multiple variations on ghosts and how they would work. And he'll just toss off all these different things about ghosts. Whereas in in one book, whereas other authors would say, oh, I've got this good idea about ghosts. I'm going to write a whole novel about that, that one idea. And Tim Powers just shoves them all in. He's incredibly creative. And interestingly, he hasn't studied parapsychology. <laughs> He's just incredibly creative. Um, when it comes to H.P. Lovecraft, who was a, a, a horror and fantasy writer from the early 20th century, some of my favorites by him include At the Mountains of Madness, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, The Shadow Out of Time, and The Mound. All right. Then our next question comes from Jessica, who writes, Why do you suppose God created the dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures? I know it's impossible to know the mind of God, but I like to think he created them to foster our sense of wonder and curiosity. What do you think? Well, I don't want to be too human-centric in our explanations. I don't want to center everything around God did this because of us. Um, I, but I don't want to exclude that either. Um, one thing I'll note is that humans tend to think of there as just being one reason why we do things. And I think that's because we have little small minds, and it's easy for us to imagine one reason for doing something. But God's mind is much bigger, and he knows everything. So he knows all of the effects that something will have all the way down through the rest of history, which is infinite. Um, so I think that we can infer, since God wants to do good, that uh, God intends all of the good effects that his actions have. Um, you know, it's not like he isn't aware of the good effects. I say he intends all the good that an action of his does, not just one part of it. And so when we apply that principle to the dinosaurs, I think he created the dinosaurs because they're cool. You know, they're like other creatures. They they show God's glory, even if they're not aware of the concept of God. They still show his creative potential because they're cool. They have cool things about them. And that's certainly true of the dinosaurs. They are cool in bunches of different ways. And God created them because of that, um, because they'd be really cool things to make. However, because I mentioned that God knows all of the good effects, he knows that we would eventually learn about the dinosaurs and we would come to appreciate how cool they are, too. So I think that, uh, Jessica, that your explanation of him creating them to foster our sense of wonder and curiosity is one of the reasons that God created the dinosaurs. He knew we'd find out about them. He knew it would inspire wonder and curiosity in us. And so that's one of the reasons that uh, that he created them. Also, I think uh, there's a case that can be made that he created them in order to set things up for us. Uh, if the dinosaurs hadn't existed, then we might not be here either. And he definitely wanted to create conscious, intelligent beings on Earth who could know and love him. And it may have been necessary to have a dinosaur phase in Earth's history in order to set the proper things up for us to come about. And so he may have also created them to help uh, make us have a logical history. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. And by Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. Our next question comes from Rob, who writes, My wife is a middle school history teacher and wanted me to ask you this after having to teach about the Donner Party. What would the moral ramifications be for the members of the Donner Party? Would it have been a grave or mortally sinful thing because the people were already dead? 
Okay, so the Donner Party um, was a 19th century group that was crossing the United States, and they got trapped by like a snowstorm, and some of them died. And in order to survive, the the others had to resort to cannibalism um, in order to have food and not starve to death. Um, cannibalism is not intrinsically wrong. Meat is just meat, you know, um, and so uh, it's it it it's not intrinsically wrong. There is a problem with it, which I'll get to though. Now, in order to document that cannibalism is not intrinsically wrong, you could point to the Eucharist and say, "Hey, you know, we're, we're consuming Jesus's flesh and blood, and that's okay." Um, you know, he told us to. Well, yeah, true, but we don't digest Jesus, so. I think that would be actually not a good argument. I don't think you can cite the Eucharist as an example of cannibalism. Jesus may go through us, but it's more like the movie Fantastic Planet, where people get small and go through someone else, but they're not digested by that person. And Jesus doesn't get digested by us in the case of the Eucharist. But still, a person's body is, you know, just meat, and there's nothing wrong with eating meat. Um except we're required to respect the remains of the dead. We're required to show them respect. Um, so even though um, even though eating human flesh is not is not intrinsically wrong, it's very often disrespectful. However, and that's part of why we find it gross. Um, there are also other reasons we find it gross, uh, but in principally that we're not used to eating it in our culture. Um, things that we don't grow up eating, we're programmed to find gross for scientific survival reasons I won't go into on this occasion. Um, but, um, there is such a thing as respectful cannibalism, where in some cultures, if someone is very revered, that culture may actually show their reverence for the person by consuming them after they die and wanting to absorb that person's wisdom or strength or things like that. So as gross as it seems to people of our culture, cannibalism actually can be a sign of respect for the dead. It's not our way of showing respect for the dead, but it is in some cultures. When it comes to the Donner Party, um, we could reasonably infer that, you know, their comrades who had died would have understood the necessity of the cannibalism in order for their companions to survive. You know, like, for example, um, let's suppose, um, let's suppose a parent dies in that situation, and for someone the parent loves to survive, that loved one has to consume the parent's body. I would imagine most of the parents would say, yeah, I'd rather have my child do this than have my child die or my loved one die. And and because I'm not using my body right now, and yeah, it's gross, but this is a desperate situation, and I would rather have them survive than not survive. And so that could indicate that they weren't being disrespectful in principle towards their towards their companions who had died. So there's a case to be made that the cannibalism that occurred in this situation would not be sinful. But that doesn't mean they didn't do other sins. In fact, they did. The Donner Party, in addition to the people that were being transported, had Native American guides and they killed at least two of the Native American guides in order to get food. And you can't kill someone in order to cannibalize them. It's one thing if you're in a desperate situation and you resort to cannibalism after someone has died, but you cannot murder people to get food, and they did. So there was sin involved in the Donner Party. Yeah, one thing that occurs to me is uh, if people think, you know, oh, cannibalism gross. Uh, Catholics, we do things that other people think are weird, like bone churches and relics. So, yeah. you know, with the with the bodies of the dead. So, yeah, um, it's interesting. Ossuaries, uh, those are called. Yes, yes. Uh, so Max has a question to hi, Jimmy and Dom. What were the Foo Fighters seen during World War II? Thanks. OK, so the Foo Fighters were lights that were observed uh, in the air 
that seem to follow or associate with or be interested in our aircraft during World War II. They look kind of like ball lightning, but um, but they seem to be around way more than ball lightning is. And they seem to be unusually reported during World War II. There was a theory that uh, we had, the Allies had, that they were some kind of Nazi weapon system or surveillance system or something. They were some kind of aircraft that the Axis powers were testing. But we learned after the war, when we beat the Axis and got their documents, they thought the same thing. They thought they were some kind of allied weapons or aerial system that we were testing. And so both sides seem to think that the other side was responsible for the Foo Fighters. And we're not sure what they are. They've been proposed as explanations as like some of the earliest UFOs. Um, I haven't studied them in detail yet, but I do plan to study them in the future and report on them in a future episode of Mysterious World. I can't hear the name Foo Fighters without thinking of the band, the Foo Fighters, and Christopher mm-hmm. Walken's famous introduction of them on Saturday Night Live. Uh, if you uh, you can look for it on YouTube, um, because the lead singer had him had told him it's pronounced Foo Fighters, <laughs> so he says, "Ladies and gentlemen, Foo Fighters," and just in that. Christopher Walken way. It's very amusing. Go look it up, folks. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sebastian has the next question. Hey, Jimmy, love your show. I don't know if this fits your Q&A format, but this is quite mysterious for me. I once had a very vivid dream. Well, it's Woke a question. Right? It's a question. So it fits my Q&A format. <laughs> there you mm-hmm. go. Uh, I once had a very vivid dream. I woke up early, was kind of a teen and therefore didn't like it and chose to close my eyes again. Then like a cinema opening, the dream began. It was very short. Vivid, I sat in a moving train, moving somewhere, I don't know. In front of me, there sat three persons. When I looked at them, I realized they didn't didn't have a normal face. Their faces were obscured, something you couldn't grasp, but I wasn't afraid of them. Something in me knew telepathically that they looked at me, weird without a face, and they knew me and they loved me. Then I woke up and felt deeply touched by it, but couldn't wrap my head around it. I always thought of Jungian archetypes, 20 years later, I sat in a cathedral and there was this beautiful altar just with images of three persons, saints, I assume. I remembered the dream again and was quite puzzled about the meaning of it. Maybe saints or just fantasies, but why no faces? Is there some ancient mystery with three persons and no faces? And also, will there be an episode about Carl Gustav Jung and his explanation of dreams? Thanks again for what you're doing and God bless Sebastian from Vienna, Austria. Well, uh, Sebastian, we very well may talk about Carl Jung in the future. I've got him on the list. In terms of the three faceless men that you saw in your dream and then on an altar, if I understand you correctly, then um, I would suspect that they would symbolize the Trinity. Um, The fact that they loved you would point in that direction, although, you know, you could also sense that saints love you. But when you see three faceless men, I tend to think Trinity. Also, when you see an altar, I tend to think Trinity rather than saints, unless it's unless I have more information. The lack of a face symbolizes mystery. And so if I think three mysterious people together in a religious concept, I think of the mystery of the divine Trinity. So... Um, so that would be my guess as what the symbolism might represent. I can't say that for sure. I, you know, um, it's often hard to know why our subconsciouses produce what they do in dreams. It's also hard to know, uh, why artists do what they do sometimes. But if I think of threeness, mystery, persons, religious context, yeah, that sounds like the Holy Trinity to me. Uh, And the next one comes from Tommy, who writes, I know Jimmy has touched on psychedelics before, but I think the issue deserves a full examination now that certain states are decriminalizing them and researchers are conducting studies of them. What are the spiritual implications of toying with these substances? What are the theories that some ancient religions were based on psychedelics? How can the experiences people report be explained, etc.? 
Well, um, so in terms of the idea that some religions are based on psychedelics, I mean, psychedelics are used in various religious ceremonies around the world. Uh, that doesn't mean the religion is based on them, but they, they are used in various rituals. For example, in the desert southwest in America, there are Native American religions that incorporate the use of peyote, just like Christianity in, in its services, just like Christianity incorporates wine in its services. Both peyote and wine are psychoactive substances, not to the same degree, but they're both psychoactive substances, and these religions both incorporate them. However, you wouldn't say Christianity is based on wine. It's based on Jesus Christ. And similarly, you wouldn't want to say that just because a Native American religion incorporates the use of peyote, that it's based on peyote. So I'd be careful about reductionism. I'd be especially careful about, re about trying to reduce Christianity to psychoactive substances. There was a guy named John Allegro um, who wrote a book called The Cross and the Sacred Mushroom, in which he proposes that Christianity is actually a psychedelic mushroom cult, which is just completely whack. And other people in the scholarship world, in the world of biblical scholarship, have looked at Allegro's claims and just said, this is nuts. This guy's just off the rails here. He, regardless of whether they're believers or non-believers, you know, other biblical scholars looked at Allegro's claims and said, this is just crazy. This is the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. And it, it does not fit the evidence. Um, we have good evidence that Jesus of Nazareth was a real human being and not a mushroom. Um, in any event, uh, psychedelics are chemical substances, just like other chemical substances. And as a result, they may have legitimate uses, such as you know, being a therapeutic means of helping people with certain psychological issues. Uh, however, that's something that still needs to be studied. If it turns out that various psychedelics uh, have legitimate therapeutic uses, then it would be morally legitimate to use them. You know, uh, everything else being equal, like they're not fantastically expensive and they don't have negative consequences that outweigh the positive ones. Um, you know, it would be legitimate to use them for whatever legitimate therapeutic effects they have. When it comes to recreational use of psychedelics, I'm cooler. Uh, I've studied the issue somewhat, but I haven't yet done detailed research. I mean, I've read a, I've read a, you know, one book all the way through about them, pretty much. Um, I do plan on doing a future episode of Mysterious World about psychedelics. And one thing that I'm quite curious about is the reports of entities, of encounters with entities when people are on psychedelic substances. You know, they talk about meeting what are sometimes called machine elves, uh, although they don't necessarily look like elves, but they look sometimes like Christmas tree ornaments or things like that. Um, I don't presently have any judgment about what such entities might be. They may be purely imaginary, just a product of the effects of the drug on the person's brain. These images may well up from the subconscious, or they could correspond to something real. And demons are a possibility, although we can't just assume that they're demons. We need evidence of the demon hypothesis in this area like in any other. And if you'd like more information about evaluating the demon hypothesis, check out episode 188. Our next question comes from Scott, who writes, Jimmy, I'm not sure if my question falls into the weird or mysterious category. I'll leave it up to you to decide what show it belongs in. Well, it's one, once again, this is patrons' questions, not patrons' mysterious questions. So you're, <laughs> you're welcome to ask it. Yes, all questions. Uh, so it's inspired by the book, The Great Divorce. In it, good people who are glorified in heaven are said to be clothed in light, but also naked. Since clothing was necessary after the fall, will we wear clothes on the new earth? Well, um, so one thing that I find interesting about the book of Genesis is it seems to recapitulate childhood development. Uh, Adam and Eve start innocent not knowing good and evil. They, they, they don't have a lot of knowledge about things. They've got enough to do their job as gardeners of Eden, but they don't, have, they don't really have knowledge beyond that. And then they see, and also they're naked, just like at the beginning, 
when children are little, they don't feel any need to wear clothing. But then, as children get over, they become wiser, and Adam and Eve become wiser. And when that happens, they feel the need to wear clothing. They develop a sense of shame, just like children do. In cultures, they eventually decide, I want to keep some things private, and they start wearing whatever level of clothing is common in their society. So, to my mind, Genesis seems to recapitulate the way we develop from children into adults. Um, now, we need, in many climates of the world, uh, clothing for temperature control and protection from our environment. Um, I suspect that we will not need clothes on the new earth, and so therefore we may not wear them. You know, we won't, I assume we won't need them because we won't feel pain and discomfort like heat and things in the environment can cause us now. We also won't have disordered sexual desires, so we won't need them for that reason. And therefore, we may be in a post-shame state where we don't need to wear clothes for any reason. And so we may not wear them. Um, I can't be sure of that. But uh, but I think it's a possibility. I also think it's a possibility that we could wear clothes, especially if we want to or choose to, like maybe out of a desire to commemorate what happened in our lives before our salvation was won. So I think it could go either way. So what you're saying is there's cosplay in heaven. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. Uh, Lauren asked this question. Hey, Jimmy, what's the deal with the news reports regarding interstellar material being discovered on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean? Are they true? And if so, what's the significance of this, this discovery? Thanks for the show. I always enjoy it. Well, there's a scientist named Avi Loeb who um, you may remember from a few years ago when an object called Oumuamua passed through our solar system. And even though Oumuamua was identified, well, it was identified as coming from outside of our solar system. So it was a piece of interstellar material. Um, and it, it was thought to be an asteroid, but it, when it swung around the sun, it did something really strange that asteroids would not do, and at least not an ordinary asteroid. And so Avi Loeb and, and some other people proposed, hey, maybe it's alien tech. Maybe that's why it behaved in an unasteroid like way. And he's similarly been interested in the possibility of finding alien tech in other ways, as well as studying interstellar material in general, because it turns out more things manage to pass between solar systems than we realized. And so, you know, Oumuamua was maybe the first uh, interstellar visitor that we noticed. But it's not the only one we found, and it turns out that it looks like an interstellar object crashed into the ocean in the not-too-distant past. And Avi Loeb and his team um, have tried to find it, you know, because if they found it and if it was alien tech, that would be really cool and proof of extraterrestrial life. So they found some little spherules, little bitty tiny spheres and stuff uh, from the bottom of the ocean that based on their composition, you know, the isotopes and elements they're made of, they think are interstellar material. Um, if it turns out, it, now they've had some pushback from other groups, but they may have rejoinders. I haven't kept up with that aspect of the literature. If it turns out that Loeb and his associates are right, well, that means that more interstellar material has come into our solar system and fallen to Earth than previously we were aware of, and it would mean we've got some of it now, so we can study it in, you know, up close under microscopes and stuff, which could teach us more about the universe outside of our solar system. Um, I don't, at least at this point, think that it's particularly likely that this was alien technology, but it would certainly be really cool if it was. Very good. Our next question comes from Iglesias, who asks, what's going on with seemingly superhuman resistance to physical injury and pain in situations such as walking on hot coals, lying on a bed of nails, having bricks or boards broken over one's head? 
it was not a trick. I could potentially be persuaded by the idea of mental resistance to pain, but the absence of physical injury is more puzzling. Mm -hmm. So some of the situations you name do involve tricks, like, for example, breaking boards. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that's always a trick, but there are situations where there's been, you know, a groove cut in the boards ahead of time to make them break easily at a certain point when they're struck. Um, for example, there are also other situations that you name that are within human abilities. Like if you lie on a bed of nails, well, um, okay, you may not really get injured from that. You've got, if the bed of nails is dense enough with a large enough number of nails, um, you, it, it, you may, you may escape without injury with your body weight distributed over many, many, many nails. You know, like if you imagine lying on a metal sheet, if it was all nail, you know, with, you could lie on a, on a metal sheet and it wouldn't hurt you. Uh, your body weight would just be distributed all across the sheet. Whereas if you imagine one nail and you try laying on that, it's not going to distribute your body weight. You're going to get punctured. So between having something that's all metal and something that's one nail, there is going to be a magic spot depending on your weight and how much of your and 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 the surface area of your back um, or backside if it's a full body one. Um, there's going to be a magic ratio of nail to body size and weight where you can lay down safely without getting injured, and this is purely natural. Similarly, when it comes to firewalking, uh, it is possible to firewalk quickly across, um, across hot coals and not be injured. And so there, you know, like there are Mythbusters videos you can watch of things like that. However, it doesn't explain everything that is known in this area. In the, in the case of firewalking, you want to get across the coals quickly. Um, because otherwise, if you're, I mean, the reason that, that they don't damage your feet is because of the heat conductivity of coals. If you were standing on a plate of metal that was that hot, you, your feet would blister immediately. Um, but coal is a lot less heat conductive than metal. And so you can stay on the coals longer without being blistered. Um, but you still have to be really quick. If you, if you don't get across the coals quickly, if you let your foot stay in contact with them for long enough, you will get burned and a blister and things like that. You can get third degree burns that way. But there are firewalkers who do not just lightly walk across the coals. There are firewalkers who will pound their feet into the coals and stand there for 30 seconds sometimes in one spot, and yet their feet are not hurt. There also are other situations where they like really fire up the coals really, really hot, and someone stands on them, and not even their leg hair is singed. So what's going on in these cases? Well, these are examples of what's known as extraordinary human performance, and it is possible that there is a parapsychological component to them in the form of psychokinesis or mind over matter. Um, I haven't done extensive research on this yet, but I am aware of these situations where there are extraordinary human performances that involve lot, not just lack of pain, but lack of injury that ought to be there given the circumstances in, in that particular case. And so uh, when I'm able to get good sources on all that, I'll be able to report about it more in the future. And uh, if you're ever in the Boston area, you can lie in your own very own bed of nails at the Museum of Science. They have a bed mm -hmm. of nails that you my kids have done it. There uh -huh. is a weight limit <laughs> for uh -huh. good reason. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so and it's a thousand nails. Uh, so it's it's pretty well distributed. Uh, and it also is one person at a time, which is a very good <laughs> argument. Um, so, yes. Uh, our next question comes from Carrie, who writes, hello, I'm so thankful for your show. Dom, you are a light and joy. Me. And Jimmy, you're so good at entertaining and educating. Has anyone suggested the far out idea that we are extensions of Adam and Eve's consciousness, sort of like a future vision of the consequence of eating forbidden fruit? 
I figure I'd lay that out there since I've thought about how God gives us the ability to play out scenarios. And I also see how we all have connected thoughts and feelings. Well, we uh, we do have connected thoughts and feelings, and that's true in a natural on a natural level, you know, because we share ideas and 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 feelings with other family members based on our experiences. There's also good evidence that um, that we're connected on a deeper, perhaps telepathic level, and. It, we're certainly connected with our first parents. You know, biologically, we wouldn't be here if we weren't connected with them. And spiritually, we're connected with them as well because we got an original sin from them, the original sin being the deprivation of sanctifying grace. So it's possible that we have a connection with their consciousness. But in terms of the idea that we're simply extensions of their consciousness, I would I would find that implausible uh, because we are biological entities with full bodies and souls of our own. And humans don't seem to have the ability to create entities with full bodies or souls of their own by mental effort alone. Um, There seem to be limits of what human psychokinesis can do. And creating creating a human body and a human soul to go with it would seem to be beyond that and thus it would seem to be beyond what Adam and Eve could do. Our next question comes from Mike, who asks, uh, I'm wondering if Jimmy has an opinion on whether the icon of the Black Madonna, that is Our Lady of Chestahova, was painted by Luke the Evangelist. Thanks. I haven't studied uh, Our Lady of Chestahova. I'm aware of it briefly, but I do not think that we have any paintings by St. Luke, and that includes the one in St. Mary Majors in Rome. I love St. Mary Majors. It is a super awesome church. I specifically love the Sistine Chapel in St. Mary Majors. The one in St. Peter's Basilica is also way cool, but I really love the one in, for, for other reasons. I love the one in St. Mary Majors. And in the Sistine Chapel in St. Mary Majors, they've got this painting of Our Lady Health of the Romans that is allegedly painted by St. Luke. But I don't think it is, and neither do art experts. Um, We have no reason, uh, no evidence that first century Christians did representational art. First century Christianity grew out of a Jewish context, and in a Jewish context, it was prohibited to depict the human form. In fact, Jews often wouldn't depict other things, although sometimes they did, but they weren't big into portraiture. And um, given the fact that the first century Christian community was largely Jewish in many places, and St. Luke himself was, you know, cheek by jowl with Jews like St. Paul and other companions who were Jewish in the Pauline circle, um, I think it would be very unlikely for Luke uh, to make such a painting it's further unlikely that even if he did make such paintings that they would have survived to today because of the way materials decay, especially in um, moist climates like you have in Europe, including Poland and including Rome, Italy, which was built on swamps. Um, you, you just wouldn't expect something. It would be unlikely for a painting on canvas or skin or wood or whatever it might be to survive for that long. And even if he had made such a painting, and even if it had survived, it should be mentioned earlier than it is. Because if it has existed from the first century and people knew about it, they should have been talking about it. And we don't see them talking about it for centuries and centuries. So it looks like these Uh, portraits that do exist were composed later. And in fact, art experts have even offered opinions on when they would have been painted based on the art style. Um, I, uh, I, I think they were made at later dates and the, and then attributed to St. Luke as part of pious legends. Just a Hallahan writes, uh, Oh no, I missed the deadline last time. And now I don't remember what I wanted to ask. I think it was that in the Catholic Church on the Secretariat, I was told at a staff meeting that we had a Eucharistic miracle in our tabernacle, and the diocese told the priests not to follow up unless it lasted for longer than six months. 
It made me wonder, are miracles common enough that everyone will encounter one at least once in their lives, but the data never gets collected and analyzed, so there's no reporting of it? Well, I think it's going to depend on what you mean by miracle. Um, I think if you mean something where God intervenes in a notable way, well, I think it's, I mean, if you if, if, if you don't mean that, if you just mean God does something, well, we all hit miracles every day because the universe would cease to exist if God didn't do a miracle to keep it in existence. Um, similarly, we wouldn't have souls if God didn't create our souls. So every time you got a new baby, God's done a miracle in order to get that baby a soul. Um, but if you mean God doing something notably out of the ordinary, um, then I think persons of faith actually are likely to encounter miracles at different points in their life. They may or may not recognize it, depending on what they've been taught to believe about miracles and how common they are. Um, and, you know, the skeptical attitudes they may have picked up from the culture around them. But I think it is likely that people of faith probably will encounter miracles at some point in their life if they have eyes to see them. I also think that many miracles are never reported. Probably the majority of miracles are never reported or at least never studied. Uh, and that's what may have been the case here with this Eucharistic miracle you report. Um, you know, the very few miracles get studied out of the large volume of them that are reported. And I think the volume that are reported are likely themselves to be a minority of those that actually occur. Uh, and our next question comes from Joseph, who asks, I would love to hear Jimmy and Dom's opinion on how Catholics should evaluate apparent manifestations of charismatic gifts. To give some background, I work in youth ministry and spend a lot of time leading trips to youth events that will include very emotional prayer experiences. For example, adoration mixed with praise and worship music. During these sessions, people will often claim to exercise charismatic gifts. Some of these are things that are mentioned in scripture and our tradition, for example, speaking in tongues or words of prophecy. There are also some phenomena that are very popular, but that I don't see a foundation for in our tradition. One example of the latter category might be resting in the spirit, where someone essentially faints and becomes unresponsive for several minutes. I'm a little torn about how to understand these phenomena. On the one hand, I truly do not want to downplay the goodness of the Holy Spirit and his ability to work wonders in our lives. On the other hand, I'm troubled by how little testing, as in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, there is of these phenomena, especially when there seem to be so many potential natural explanations. For example, resting in the Spirit often seems like immature teenagers getting worked up in a hot, stuffy gym. Most of the words of prophecy that people have offered me just seem like bad, cold reading. I really do not want to be snarky about potential actions of the Holy Spirit, but I'm not sure to what degree we can respectfully doubt the validity of some of these experiences. I'd love to hear Jimmy's thoughts on this or charismatic phenomena, especially the more miraculous ones in general. So I should probably explain a couple things that um, that Joseph mentioned. One of them is he mentioned 1 Thessalonians 5.21. And that's uh, part of a passage where St. Paul is talking to the Thessalonians, and he says, Do not despise prophecyings, but test everything and hold fast to what is good. So we can see already, and actually 1 Thessalonians is probably the first letter that St. Paul wrote. He probably wrote it about the year AD 50, which is just 17 years after the crucifixion. And so we already see that some in the Christian community were being tempted to despise prophecies, to discount or dismiss them. And so St. Paul has to tell them, don't do that. Uh, instead, you want to test everything and hold fast to whatever is good. And I think that's the, the correct, balanced way to do it. Um, Joseph also mentions that he thinks uh, various words of prophecy that he's been given seem to him to be bad cold reading. Cold reading is a technique that magicians use when they deduce information about a person based on their observation of that person. So it's like, if I meet you and I see you're wearing a t-shirt I could about Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, Dom, I could say, ah, I perceive that you are interested in the mysterious. Or if I see you with a wedding ring, I could infer that you're married or things like that. All of that's cold reading. The opposite is hot reading, where I do research on you in advance. 
um, so that I can then pass off the information I got as as prophetically or psychically obtained. Now, cold reading is is a technique that's used by magicians to create the illusion of having um, paranormal knowledge, but it's also used by psychics, um, some of whom are fraudulent. Others, though, are not fraudulent, and they don't even realize that what they're doing is cold reading. There have been cases of uh, of psychics who have um, who have later, upon reflecting on their career, said, "You know, I I thought I was being psychic at the time, but I think really I was I was just cold reading." And so you can do cold reading unintentionally, where you don't you're getting insights about a person based on what you're perceiving, but you're not you just aren't correctly identifying what the source of those insights are. And so it's possible that someone who thinks the Holy Spirit has given them a word of wisdom, well, they could have perceived things about you and and then deduced certain things and thought, oh, the Holy Spirit's just given me this insight when really it was cold reading. So that's possible. When it comes to our attitude towards these experiences, I think that um, with St. Paul's instruction in 1 Thessalonians 5, we need to be open, uh, but we also need to be discerning. We can't exclude, when it comes to particular things like resting in the Spirit, which is a very newly named phenomenon, although there have been reports going back in history much longer of people becoming overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit and kind of passing out or becoming unresponsive. Um, I don't think we can exclude them in principle. Uh, in fact, just a few years ago, the what's now the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith came out with a document about charismatic gifts. The document's called Uvenescit Ecclesia, if you want to look it up. Um, and one of the things the document points out is that in none of the spiritual gifts passages in St. Paul, the two main ones being um, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 and Romans 12. There are a few other lesser ones too, but in none of these passages is St. Paul trying to give an exhaustive list of spiritual gifts. So you can't just read these passages and say, hey, resting in the Spirit's not mentioned here, because St. Paul wasn't trying to be exhaustive. Also, Juvenescat Ecclesia points out the Holy Spirit can give new gifts in new periods of history. It's not like there's a single list and the Holy Spirit is confined to that. Uh, as people encounter different circumstances, the Holy Spirit can give gifts that are appropriate to those circumstances. So if in the 20th century, let's say, at the end of the 20th century, which is when resting in the Spirit, also formerly known as being slain in the Spirit, when that became common— um, even though it exi had existed before. But when that became common, well, maybe people were getting open to having this type of experience, and so it started happening more because they were more open to it. It's like, you know, in the Gospels, uh, it mentions at one point, Jesus couldn't do many miracles in this town because of the people's lack of faith. So if you need openness to the miracles in order to have Jesus do miracles, well, the same thing can be true with other experiences, including experiences of the Holy Spirit. If you're open to it, the Holy Spirit will do more than if you're not open to it. And so maybe people became open to things like being slain in the Spirit. On the other hand, resting in the Spirit may also have a purely natural cause. Uh, it may be, as, as you say, Joseph, just teenagers getting excited and they, they want to have this experience, and so they have it for purely natural reasons. And that's true. That can happen too. On the other hand, even if it is, even if it's a spiritual experience that occurs for natural reasons, just because the teen gets excited and is expecting it to happen, well, that doesn't mean it's not a genuine spiritual experience that the Holy Spirit can work through. I mean, you know, maybe the teen did just get excited and expected this to happen and conk, they lay themselves out but the Holy Spirit can still work through that and touch the teen's heart. Now, in terms of a general approach to making an assessment of was a reported charismatic experience real or not, I, I think that unless there is a pressing reason 
to need to settle whether a charismatic experience had a supernatural cause, my own attitude is to suspend judgment. So unless I have a pressing need to figure this out, I don't try to figure it out. You know, I'll I'll note that a person has had this experience. They've reported this experience. If they tell me about it, I'll say, oh, that's very interesting. And I'll be supportive of them without challenging it unless they ask me, what do you think about this? Could this have been supernatural? In which case, I'll be honest with them. Or unless there's a need to determine, is it, was it genuinely supernatural or not? And in some cases, it could well be there's a genuine pressing need to figure out, was this supernatural or not? Like if someone comes to you and gives you a prophecy and says, oh, you, uh, you, uh, you better go to the doctor and take this medical treatment because you've got a secret disease. It's going to kill you if you don't. Um, okay, well, I need to know, do I need to act on that? You know, so, um, so in some cases like prophecy, there can be a pressing need to decide, was this genuinely supernatural or not? And in that case, I'd treat the experience like I would any other paranormal investigation. Uh, you want to think of natural explanations first. You want to consider, are these natural explanations plausible um, explanations for what happened? Do they, are, the, are they the ones that best fit the evidence? And if they don't fit the evidence the best, then that would point us towards a paranormal explanation, including a supernatural one. Um, one thing that can do that is information that turns out to be veridical, meaning it's something you didn't know, but when you check it out, it turns out to be true. So if a person is prophesying to me and telling me you need to do X, Y, Z, I would ask for some kind of information that I'd ask them a question. I don't know the answer to, and they don't either, but I can check it out and find out, is it accurate or not? Um, Also, there's another situation in which I could, um, I could pass a form of judgment on, on a charismatic experience. And that's if I see a gift that's being used inappropriately, this is something that, uh, St. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. In particular, he talks about the misuse of the gift of speaking in tongues. And if I see a gift being misused, then I would say, okay, it, it, it's being misused, just like St. Paul did. That wouldn't, though, tell us it wasn't genuine. Uh, you'll notice if you read 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, St. Paul says, y'all are misusing the gift of tongues, but he never says, y'all are faking the gift of tongues, or this is imaginary. It is possible for someone to have a spiritual gift that's genuinely of God, and yet, because of the role of human free will, they can genuinely misuse it. When it comes to the supernaturality of, of these experiences, I suspect two things. The first one is I suspect that many people in the charismatic community overestimate how many charismatic experiences are genuinely supernatural. I think there's likely considerable misestimation on the high side of thinking things are supernatural when in fact they have natural explanations. The second thing I suspect is that people outside the charismatic community underestimate how many charismatic experiences are genuinely supernatural. Uh, For people who aren't in a charismatic context, it can be easy for them to say, oh, this isn't genuinely supernatural, and do exactly what St. Paul is warning against in 1 Thessalonians 5. So I think charismatics tend to overestimate how many such experiences are supernatural. I think non-charismatics tend to underestimate how many charismatic experiences are genuinely supernatural. So I think the truth, if I had the time and liberty to do detailed investigations and statistical surveys, would show that the the truth is somewhere in the middle. We hope you've enjoyed this patron's question show. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is only possible because of the generosity of our patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to support Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and have your question answered on a future show for patrons, go to sqpn.com give. 
Again, you can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 301. So that's it from us this time. What are your theories about the issues we've covered in this episode? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, or in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they've done on this episode. You can check out the video version of the podcast by going to youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And you can also help my channel grow, which is something I'm working on. The way you can help is by liking commenting and subscribing because if you like comment and subscribe that tells youtube you found the video engaging and other people may find it engaging too so without really just doing more than clicking a like button writing a comment and hitting subscribe you can help the channel grow um and uh, when you hit subscribe, be sure and hit the bell notification so that you always get notified whenever I put out a new video, whether it's Mysterious World or one of the other videos that I release every week. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. And by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. And by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. And then until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Don Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.